it was a three-year project. It just ended at the end of 2015. And um, the end line was just completed last month as well. So this is the learning to date as of the end of 2014, which was the end of the second year of a three-year program. Uh, and we're eagerly awaiting the end line results. Um, I'm sure Tufts is uh, crunching data as we speak. Um, but we thought the findings were um, interesting enough to present uh, at, uh, as they are to date. So just two um, disclaimers. One is that one about the end line. This story could change once we get those results, obviously. And the second one is that I'm not an agriculturalist. I'm a nutritionist. And you won't get... There, there is a strong agricultural component in this program, but you won't get a lot of um, rich detail, uh, unfortunately, in this presentation. Um, so I thought I'd start with two key messages um, at the risk of stealing my own thunder, um, just putting them up there, uh, because I think they complement some of the agri-diet conclusions, which is that WASH, in fact, from our findings from the midline, is that WASH, in fact, may be um, at least as important as agriculture to improve nutrition in this context. And it just underscores how important it is to understand your own context where you're, where you're working or living. Uh, and the second headline is that size matters. And specifically, we've found that village size matters. And I'll explain a bit more about that. But for us, that underscores that despite trying, as we're all striving to um, develop and, and deliver multi-sectoral <coughs> programs with different interventions that we can't ignore the coverage that we're achieving, we're saturating, we're converging all these um, these different sec multi-sectoral interventions and making sure that we are in, in order to have an impact. Okay, so this is just background on, on our program area. Um, I might just... Uh, just highlight that it's largely agro-pastoralists. The main um, harvest, October, November, it's millet, sorghum, ground nuts. It's French-speaking and Arabic-speaking. Malnutrition is high. Gender inequality is, is widespread. Um, polygamy is practiced, not that the two go hand-in-hand, in hand, but um, it definitely affects the social dynamic. Migration levels are high, often up to Libya. The health system is very weak, and there's a history of displacement due to conflict and drought. And that's it. It's just on the border with Sudan. Uh, so how our CRAM model, which is what we described it as first, because it was, in fact, a bit of a um, headquarters conceptual model um, that then quickly was taken up by our concerned CHAD team and fully developed. But it was, based on our experience in many countries, um, realizing that trying to reach these um, rather elusive development goals in places that are constantly experiencing shocks and stresses such as droughts, floods, earthquakes, um, particularly in Chad it was drought and occasionally floods, um, just wasn't working. So <clears throat> from this conceptual model which was in kind of technical advisors' heads and a little bit on paper, it was fully fleshed out in Chad, turned into an integrated multi-sectoral design with this contingency plan. So Allow, uh, trying to detect when uh, a particular shock was going to come and be prepared to respond to these localized emergencies. Um, and I put this in blue because I think, and not just because I think our shade is in the room, but because I, I think it's a message that has to get out there that it was really the um, opportunity of the multi-annual Irish aid funding. We get institutional funding from Irish aid for a five-year time span, and this is just the kind of opportunity that you, you need to develop these kinds of programs, especially in difficult contexts such as CHAD. Um, so it was a three-year pilot program. I put pilot in, in quotes there only because we've already uh, moved on with different funding uh, for a similar program, even though the end line results aren't in, but it was seen as an opportunity for learning, and that's why the partnership with the Feinstein International Center to develop a very strong impact evaluation and operational research was at the core of the program. Um, this is the conceptual <coughs> model. So <clears throat> we aim to improve child nutrition, food security, and resilience to future shocks and stresses. Just around the, the theme of measurement, um, it, we have very clear metrics around child nutrition and some around food security. We're still struggling a bit to figure out how we measure resilience to future shocks and stresses, but it's there in, in principle, and we're working on that. 
So essentially, a conceptual model was an integrated set of interventions, um, agriculture wash, health system strengthening, social and behavior change, and gender equality, all being appropriate, and that's to, to be delivered in all years. And then an early warning system, as I said, to detect when, uh, for example, a poor harvest is coming. That would tie, t- uh, sorry, trigger timely response, and that would be delivered in a bad year. So that was kind of the theory in Chad. These are the interventions that, um, more detailed interventions roughly, that were delivered. And this was focused on predicting poor harvest. So in terms of agriculture, it was really lead farmers um, two per village who were trying to promote particularly um, conservation agriculture and some climate, climate smart agricultural practices, vegetable gardens for women, and we had behavior change, communication to improve mothers' understanding and also build their confidence um, around caring for their children and seeking care at the health centers. Very importantly, we drilled one borehole or ensured that there was one borehole per village and also supported latrine building. Uh, and um, then we provided support to the health system and some other aspects around animal health workers. Um, we, we did try to promote women's, or, or in, the, in theory, we were going to really uh, make an effort in promoting women's decision-making. Um, I almost put as my third message that promoting women's or gender equality is very hard, but it seemed a bit defeatist. But I, we haven't really shifted much in the equality aspect, but we're working on it. Okay, so here's the impact evaluation design. So 35 villages were randomly received, uh, or sorry, randomly selected to receive the whole integrated package and 35 villages randomly selected to not receive. Basically, they were the control villages and we had a baseline survey, midline survey, endline survey. And the same households were followed up um, at the baseline, the midline, and the endline. So there's a lot of tracking going on there. Um, a similar um, design as the agri diet in that respect. Qualitative research, as, as well as some longitudinal monthly data collection, which I'll, which I'll show you in a minute. So um, in terms of program impact, there are kind of two pieces of findings. The first is around, did this integrated model that we designed work and uh, as compared for those who received it as compared to those in the control group? We don't have multiple arms, so we can't say, for example, that it was the addition of WASH, the addition of um, community health workers, to say what worked. We just have, it worked, it didn't work. Um, So at Midline, what we found is a direct result of the program, that levels of acute malnutrition among children have reduced, albeit in smaller villages, not in larger villages. And we don't fully understand yet why. Households are better able to cope with the hunger gap, um, and this was as measured by the Coping Strategy Index. Um, but, and I, I'll get into this in the next slide, just it was only captured from the monthly data. So this idea of seasonality, um, not just in how it affects people, but how you're monitoring systems, you have to include some kind of seasonality if, when, you're dealing, um, when you're trying to see what works in these contexts is, is also uh, emerging. And more parents brought their sick children for treatment at a health center, hospital, or mobile clinic in our program Mm -hmm. villages. So we had a community health um, component in the intervention or program villages and not in the control villages, and that seems to have made a difference. Um, So just in terms of the measures of food security we used, uh, sorry, there are a few more findings, but just while we're on this topic of um, coping with the the hunger gap, we used a community or coping strategy index, which I won't go into, but it's basically 10 questions of how people have, how you're coping with food shortages, total months of food insecurity, and household diet diversity. So I'm glad the, the um, theme of seasonality uh, has already been introduced because this is one of the key findings. And again, it's, it's really in terms, it, it's partially in terms of being able to measure impact of a program like this. So this is the coping strategy index. So basically, the higher your score, the worse off you are. So fewer coping strategies down below here, and the worse off there. The top line are our control villages. So this is the longitudinal longitudinal data that was collected from 60 households um, every month to say, did you do any of these 10 behaviors? It starts from kind of moderate or mild food uh, coping strategies to really extreme, and I think the last one is going without food for an entire day. 
Um, so the control villages, as you can see, overall had higher, they, they were doing worse, they were employing more coping strategies, and our program villages were lower and kind of able to cope. Um, and the interesting thing there then is just that the harvest, which happens around October, November, they kind of converge again. So in our, in our um, kind of annual surveys or our baseline, midline, and line, we wouldn't have picked that up at all if it wasn't for this um, subsample. <coughs> So just back to the, the last, uh, I think, four um, findings, headline findings. Um, more households, this is around WASH, so more households reported using an improved source for drinking water, which was a borehole, which isn't surprising because, as I said, we um, established uh, one in each village. Um, but just to note that that increase was greater in smaller villages. Again, I'll come back to that. Uh, more households knew the critical times to wash hands, and there were further signs of improved hygiene were seen as well in terms of um, the portion of households uh, who had a hand washing statement station or could actually display proper hand washing technique was higher in the control villages, but only in the smaller control villages. Or, sorry, in the intervention villages, but only in the smaller intervention villages. So basically, we're seeing an impact on hygiene uh, in our program villages, and especially in the smaller villages. And finally, there were no impre- improvements seen in female decision-making in the household, which is a shame, but to be perfectly honest, we, didn't actually, we weren't actually able to uh, implement a lot of gender activities, and that has been addressed. We have a new gender strategy going forward. Um, so the final thing is less about impact of our program, but looking at the wider data set, so looking at the, the program and the control um, villages and the households within them together as, as a whole set, acute male nutrition in children under five was found to be significantly linked to the frequency with which households reported washing their water containers. Um, and the presence of livestock, it was also linked to the presence of livestock in the village. So if livestock in particular in that village, um, if there was a greater concentration of livestock and if they were also reported to be using the same, um, you know, in a borehole, you know, using the same uh, water point rather than a separate um, water hole for animals, then the children in those villages were more likely to be acutely malnourished. And probably the most important thing is that no such link was found between acute malnutrition and any of the three food security measures that I mentioned before. So it's really just, and it could be specific to this context, and I think, as Ed said, there's, uh, it, it's complicated. There's probably a lot more going on. But for us, this is very, very interesting. It's just we don't have, there's a paper being produced. It's been produced by Tufts. We're just waiting for it to be published so that we can share it um, more widely. Um, and then, again, the end-line findings will hopefully either strengthen or potentially refute that that midline finding. But basically watch this space. There's more coming. Um, do I have time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Very interested in this now. Okay. So this is, uh, so the last, I was mentioning about an early warning system. I think it, in fairness, what we have so far, something that Tufts has developed, it's an early warning um, modeling. So it's, it, it's able to predict this is, I just took this picture off the website because we, I don't think we, I don't know if we have uh, a map. This is, I think, North America somewhere. But it's from the same um, website that has the data sets that Tufts has used to develop this model. So they basically use rainfall data um, from satellite, from satellite source showing the total amount and the distribution of rainfall. And it's, I think it's down to a 10 kilometer, square kilometer um, area. They compared that with historical rainfall data. Or they, they compared that, so they took that data set, it's a massive thing, I think NASA and the, some Japanese um, outfit organizers at Paul knows more. Um, and they, uh, they took the, la- the last 10 years of that data and they compared it against what the Ministry of Agriculture in Chad had as the last 10 years of millet and sorghum harvest and it was very strongly correlated. Uh, so, and they also compared it against, they, they took uh, a sample of people and asked um, older people and ask them to remember the last 10 years and rate the last 10 years as very bad, bad, good, very good. Um, and that also correlated quite well with the harvest data and, and the rainfall data. So it seems to be a good, a, a good fit, a, a good um, proxy, the rainfall data for food security and the harvest. Oh, shoot. Um, 
it appears to be quite predictive. Uh, probably more work needs to be done. I mean, it's similar to FuseNet, but it's really down to a very uh, localized level, um, and strictly on rainfall. And it gives you a better. It gives. It's, it has given us for the past two years roughly two month advance um, prediction of what the harvest is going to be like, which did allow us, I think, in 2013 to actually scale up a seed distribution um, a bit in advance. So more work is to be done to build the whole early warning system. So as I said, there's a lot going on at the regional level, the national level, that we need to look at. Um, uh, we need to look at the whole picture and kind of figure out how this fits in and make sure we're not contradicting or going against. So quick implications for programs. So the multi-sectoral program seems to be working to prevent acute malnutrition, but as I said, we need to ensure sufficient coverage, and this is this small village versus large village. So I think it, it's probably obvious that if you dig a borehole in a village with 500 people and one with 150 people, that, that the, the borehole in the village with 150 people should have, it will probably have greater impact in terms of they'll have more water, they'll have more regular access to it, they don't have to wait in line potentially. Um, and the same would go for interactions with community health workers if you have, uh, I don't know, I don't have the figures in front of me, but if you have the same number chasing 150 villages versus 500, there's probably a lot more that can be done. At the same time, there could be something else intrinsically about the social network in a small village. Maybe it's more coherent. Maybe there's a tipping point at which people, the whole village just says, right, we're going to start breastfeeding or we're going to start washing our hands. Or, uh, so we don't really fully understand that. Um, and just this hygiene along, along the water chain. I think I didn't mention that we did a lot of testing along the water chain to confirm some of this, and hopefully we'll have, as I said, more on this and the livestock link with acute malnutrition soon. Um, I think I already mentioned that, and I mentioned that. So these are just more general ones, strong impact evaluation, very helpful and useful. Uh, the, the importance of the longitudinal data alongside that and the qualitative data to explain the why and the how. So there's a strong qualitative element that um, has actually just come through in the last day or so from Tufts. Uh, so we should have a lot to say, hopefully, in about uh, two to three months. And the last one, sorry, it's getting um, knocked off there, but it's just that this partnership between NGOs and uh, academic institutions like Tufts um, can really work and uh, we can really advance learning in leaps and bounds, but they do require work, um, they do require clear budgets, contracts, expectations, regular consultation and flexibility. And we used a small steering committee internally that, that seemed to work. Uh, last slide is just endline results, as, as I said, to be analyzed and shared. Um, and the continuation, so CRAM has finished and the randomized control trial has finished, or randomized control design uh, has finished. Um, but we've already, um, it, that's overlapped with new funding from DFID under the Building Resilience and Adaptation to Climate Extremes in Chad and Sudan, where we're basically going to expand this CRAM approach. It's a three-year programming. The program will continue with Tufts and, the, and we'll uh, also be working with the World Agroforestry Center incorporate more, try to adapt the model to pastoralists, particularly working with the pastoralist-focused uh, NGO in Sudan, and more to come.